Ed Thorpe is a genius and a rich one at that. Many years ago, he figured out card counting, cleaned up in Vegas, wrote a bestseller about it, and changed gambling forever. Then he moved to a bigger casino, Wall Street, revolutionized that too with things like options and hedge funds. He even devised an early computer. He's known all sorts of interesting people from mob types to Nobel Prize winners. He's a math prof himself, a founding faculty member of UC Irvine, but he's always been one foot in, one foot out of academia. The world is his real classroom and he has lessons to share. Ed Thorpe, right now on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University, with its Center for Science and Technology, under construction in Orange, California, is a proud sponsor of Inside OC. Self-selection keeps going. Yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Rick Reef, and I'm talking with Ed Thorpe. Ed, so great to have you back. You've got a book, a new book out, A Man for All Markets, and it's going to be hitting uh, Amazon very shortly. Already the pre-orders have you number one in gambling and number one in investing on, uh, uh, on the Amazon site. Uh, tell us about this book. Uh, uh, why write this book? Well, <clears throat> I got into uh, playing blackjack and uh, figuring out how to win, and the same thing with roulette. And then I took the ideas I had there and went on to Wall Street where they worked. And I had a lot of adventures along the way, met a lot of interesting people, and people asked me about all these things that happened. So uh, there were a lot of good stories. And I said, well, it'd uh, be fun to put all these down and share these stories with uh, everybody. And then I thought about it some more. And I said, well, the way I think about things is somewhat different than almost everybody that I meet. And it's been very helpful to me. And maybe I can get that across in this book, too. So all that motivated me to uh, be basically tell my story so and hopefully do some good for other people. So it's autobiographical, and it's also kind of a how-to book, uh, not just about investing, but uh, actually living life. That's right. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the book. Let's talk about the beginning. Uh, where, uh, where did you grow up? I was born in Chicago uh, at the very bottom of the Great Depression. So I grew up there, and then uh, when World War II came, my family moved to California because there were better jobs out here. So I grew up in Southern California. You were a smart kid, and you also, uh, uh, I guess, precocious, would that be the word? You, uh, you, you did a lot of pranks, uh, and uh, you liked to blow things up. Well, when I was uh, living out in California, I was going to a very um, non-academic school at that time. It was called Narbonne High School in a little town called Lomita, and it ranked 31 out of 32 in the LA Unified School District. So they didn't have academic courses, but I was interested in science and math, astronomy, physics, chemistry, electronics, and so on. So I just started teaching myself. And while I did it, I entertained myself at the same time by putting what I learned to uh, kind of fun tests. I made uh, black powder, rockets, uh, something called gun cotton, nitroglycerin, and uh, other kind of risky things, which I wouldn't recommend doing today. And, 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 and live to uh, tell the story. Luckily, uh, nothing bad happened. And, and one time, uh, one time uh, it was, uh, I, I'm thinking of, uh, I don't know if it was uh, Animal House, I'm trying to think of, there was that movie where, uh, you know, there was a panic in a pool, but you actually created some kind of red blob that started taking over the swimming pool in Long Beach? Yeah, what happened was I discovered uh, a powerful dye called aniline red, and it would color six million times its volume, blood red. So I thought to myself, well, th this could lead to some fun. So I got about uh, 20 grams of it and put a little pinch of it in the goldfish pool. And the goldfish pool turned totally blood red. And my mother came out and thought 
that blood was me and I was somewhere in the goldfish pool. So she began to scream. So, <laughs> so then I thought, well, what about doing this on a bigger scale? <laughs> <laughs> and hence the pool and people, and, and, and you, were never, you were never caught, right? I mean, it was made the newspapers that this had happened. Yeah, well, I went down to uh, the biggest indoor swimming pool around the Long Beach Plunge, uh, and I colored that quite red with my aniline dye, but no one ever knew who did it or how it happened. And it was in the newspapers the next day that some prankster had done this. Everybody ran screaming from the pool. They all got tickets to get back in, but uh, many of them did not use those tickets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when did you know I'm smarter than other people? I, I don't think of myself or other people that way. I mean, everybody's good at something, and uh, any, any person knows something some other person doesn't know and can do something some other person doesn't know. They can sing better, they can run faster, they can uh, speak more languages, whatever it happens to be. So I, I just don't think in those terms. All right, so you never thought of yourself as uh, like superior or, or anything like that? No. But, but obviously other people, I mean, like your parents, your teachers, did they, did they talk about, wow, this, this kid's really brilliant? Well, I know that uh, when I came out from Chicago, it was the middle of the sixth grade when we came out, and they wanted me to repeat the sixth grade since I missed the first half of it. And I didn't want to repeat it, and so they gave me a test. And I didn't know what the test was or why I was taking it. So I answered most of the questions, and then I just drew a line through the trues on the rest of them so I could go out and play. And then I learned that it was a test to keep me, uh, to allow me to progress to the seventh grade. And I was very upset because I thought, you know, I would have tried harder and done better. And it turned out it was, it turned out it was an IQ test. And when they saw the test, they advanced me to the seventh grade with no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you do talk about IQ in there. One of the things, one of the devices you uh, invented was something that you could open up doors and things like that. At one point, I think you went into to one of the schools so that, uh, at night so you could see your IQ score. But you don't ever mention your IQ. Uh, why is that? Well, I don't see any point in it. Uh, first of all, it's just a number. Secondly, it doesn't test everything uh, that a person is able to do and their whole set of abilities. So it's, it's like somebody walking around with uh, a uh, star on their chest or a ribbon on their sleeve. Uh, I see no point in that. Okay. You went to Vegas. Uh, let's talk about, uh, first, it, you were a professor before you uh, uh, beat, beat the dealer, right? Yes. Uh, uh, so you're a professor at MIT. That's like, those are the, sm that's, that's the ultimate. Well, I was a little lower than a professor. What happened was uh, I got my PhD in math at UCLA, and then I got a position at MIT. It's a, a so-called CLE Moore instructorship, but it's a, com a competitive honorary instructorship that a lot of uh, very distinguished people have held. Including the beautiful mind guy, right? Yes, uh, John Nash was one of them. Another fellow who won something called the Fields Medal, Paul Cohen was another mm -hmm. one. And Fields Medal is like a Nobel Prize, only it's in mathematics. Uh -huh. So a, a, lot of, a lot of really famous people had that position. So, um, and so, so that's, that's how you started at, at MIT. And then how did you get uh, uh, from there to Las Vegas? Well. I actually had the idea while I was um, at UCLA uh, to beat roulette, to actually build a machine to predict where the ball would come out. And I was convinced I could do that. I started doing experiments. And the experiments were very positive and convinced me that I was almost sure to be able to do it. And uh, just to check it out, I was at a party one time and there was a guy sitting in an al alcove playing the bongo drums. And uh, his name was Richard Feynman. So I walked over to him and I said to myself, if he knows, if anybody knows how to beat roulette, this guy will. So I went over and asked him if he knew of any way to beat roulette and he said, no, there isn't any way. So I said, that's great because if he doesn't know, maybe I'm the only guy who does. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that got me interested in um, trying, to, trying to beat a casino gambling game. Uh -huh. So I went out to Vegas over Christmas vacation while I was still at UCLA and I went there to case roulette wheels, and before I left, somebody told me about a blackjack strategy that was uh, almost even for the player. You couldn't win, but it'd be almost even. I said, well, if I'm gonna be playing roulette in casinos, 
I better learn something about what it's like to be in a casino and to bet money. So I brought a few bucks along and I sat down and played blackjack for about 40 minutes. And what happened to me there, which I tell about in the book, led me to go right back to UCLA, grab the article, think about it, and see how to beat blackjack too. So now I worked on both things at the same time for the next two years, beating roulette and beating blackjack. Okay, And, and they both worked out. Right, yeah. And, uh, and uh, time won't permit us to get into everything, but, but the story of, of the roulette wheel, the experimentation, uh, uh, you know, all of the things you went through are fascinating. But uh, at Blackjack, you came up basically card reading. Is, uh, if it's not your invention, it's your perfection. You came up with this system for reading cards. It's now very common because you wrote the best-selling book, Beat the Dealer, that's all about that. But talk about the experiences in Vegas. How did you get in? And Because once you started winning, people got suspicious, and they didn't like it. Well, when I first started to play, they didn't realize what was happening. They just knew that somehow I was too good, and I must be doing something. Uh, some people thought I could count every single card, use all that information, and make unbelievable computations in my head, and then uh, do it that way. Other people thought I was marking the cards or doing something to them, fooling with them somehow. Uh, other people just didn't know, but they didn't want my action because uh, they didn't want to lose the money. And uh, word gradually spread that uh, there was this uh, problem player. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not in this for the money. The reason that I uh, worked out blackjack in the first place, and the same thing with roulette, is that mathematicians, of which I was one, had spent a couple hundred years developing something called probability theory. And with that theory, they showed that almost no gambling system could possibly work, and almost no gambling game could possibly, could possibly be beaten. So I thought, this is going to be big news. This is a math problem that's worth uh, telling people the answer to. So that's how I got into it. And then when I actually figured out how to beat blackjack, for example, there was a lot of uh, cynicism from, from casinos and in the press. And I also got people wanting to back me. So I said, well, maybe there's something I'm overlooking. So I need to go out there and actually show it works. And so I went out there and it worked. And some of the people that backed you were, you might say, unsavory characters. Uh, as I found out later. <laughs> <laughs> One of them uh, was a uh, famous gambler. And uh, mobster may not be quite the right word, but uh, he was involved in uh, bootlegging and uh, uh, numbers rackets and that sort of thing, and uh, associated with some uh, worse people. But I didn't know that at the time. He was a very successful businessman. He owned 64 parking lots in downtown Manhattan alone. He told me that when it snowed one day, he lost uh, a million and a half dollars in uh, <coughs> revenue. So he appeared to be a legitimate businessman. And in fact, um, when Connie Bruck wrote a book about uh, Steve Ross called Master of the Game. She referred to this guy, Emmanuel Kimmel, and he was the big money behind what eventually became uh, time, uh, time Warner when things got merged together. Okay, so he kind of gave you a stake, right, for, for you to bet and play with. All together, roughly how much did you win for yourself and for your partners uh, with this uh, you know, little uh, foray into uh, Vegas? Well, first foray, um, he wanted to put $100,000 up, which would be, in today's dollars, close to a million. And I said to myself, I haven't done this. I don't know how I'm going to feel playing with money on a far larger scale than anything I've handled. So I'm going to start small. So I said, I only want to take $10,000 for the bankroll, and I'm going to play like that's all we have. And he was quite disappointed, but he went along with it, hoping maybe I would change my mind, which I did not. <laughs> and so uh, we went out there, and with our $10,000, and I played for small stakes for about 20 hours uh, just to get warmed up and get used to the field handling the money and uh, playing the cards well. And then I played for bigger stakes for the last 20 hours, and we a little more than doubled that 10000 So we made about 11000 uh, uh -huh. in 20 hours of serious play, which would be about the same thing with another zero on the end now. Yeah. And so all told, uh, is it, was that about what you won? Uh, no, uh, I won more money in other trips, too. So all together, what Maybe would you? Maybe 25000 25000 or so. And, but uh, I, I might point out I wasn't in it for the money. Right. Okay. 
interesting, uh, uh, some interesting adventures you had. And, and by the way, we're taking a look now at a, uh, a quiz show from the 60s called I've Got a Secret. Mm -hmm. And you were a guest on I've Got a Secret. And uh, you actually, I think, did okay. You made 500 bucks because two of the four panelists guessed wrong. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, now that's something couldn't have happened nowadays. If you came out with a best-selling book on uh, beating Vegas, uh, uh, you, you'd be famous before you ever went on a quiz show, right? I think so. Yeah. So anyway, tell us some of the interesting stories. You, uh, I mean, with at Vegas, uh, they're, they're, they were pretty, they treated you kind of roughly at times in the casinos. Well, that was back in uh, the 60s that I did most of my playing, early, early and mid-60s. And at that time, it was pretty well mobbed up. And they, they honor that era now with a uh, mob casino in Las Vegas. They're kind of semi-proud of all that. And at that point, people were being beat up kicked out, having the money taken away, uh, cheated, drinks drugged, and so forth. And you, you, had, you had a drink drugged, right? I, I did. I, it, almost, it was almost the end of me as it turned out. Wow, yeah, so I mean, you're playing and suddenly you're not able to play anymore. No, so. Also, you had a, your car was sabotaged. Talk about that. Yeah, that's why it was almost the end of me. Uh, the, uh, after I left on um, one of the gambling trips, which I talk about, this happened to be a trip where we were beating the side bets in Baccarat, another thing they thought couldn't be done. We were driving home and uh, the car accelerator pedal locked down. We were coming downhill in Arizona, pretty steep downhill, and I was going 60 when this happened, and then it got up to 80 and I couldn't stop the car with the brakes. So then I um, put on the brakes, the emergency brake, uh, shifted down uh, as far as I could and turned off the key. And all that was able to bring the car to a halt after a while. And you, and you got the message? Uh, yes, it turned out that something very strange had been done to the uh, linkage between the brake pedal and whatever it operates to make the car go faster and slower. Did, did you ever go to the authorities? Did you ever uh, go to the police and say, these guys did this to me? Where's your evidence? <laughs> okay. That's why cheating is so, was so effective in those days. Somebody deals you a uh, 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 second deal in, uh, from a deck, they yeah. d deal you the uh, card under the top card, and you can say it happened and they can say it didn't. Okay. It's he said, she said, or he said, he said. Right. And of course, the way the casinos reacted, it's comical, it's all in the book, and, uh, but, but that's interesting too, the way they kind of denied, uh, you know, they, they, they denied you had a system, but they didn't want you to bring your non-system into their casino. So let's talk about the, uh, I think what you, call, you might call a bigger casino, Wall Street. Uh, how did you go from Las Vegas to Wall Street? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, I was the kind of guy who ended up having to teach himself stuff when he was in uh, grammar school and high school just because the opportunities for having other people teach me weren't there. And so after teaching myself things about gambling and probability, I realized that now I've made some money from that and from some book royalties. And I had finally, for the first time in my life, I had some savings. So I made a couple of investments and they did terribly. So I stopped to think, I said, you know, you're an idiot. You don't know anything about investing. You need to think about this if you don't want to lose your money. So I started educating myself about investing, and I realized as I did that, that much of the stuff I learned in gambling was perfect as training for uh, becoming an investor. In fact, I would say that casino gambling, if you do it the right way, playing at the blackjack tables uh, with a, a winning system, is a better training ground than anything else I've ever seen for understanding how to be a good investor. And it seems surprising because investing is supposedly so complicated, but you learn discipline, you learn money management, and you learn to uh, compute with numbers and probabilities. And you came up with a system for, uh, I guess, uh, 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 valuing uh, uh, options and things like that. There's another, there's a best-selling book by a, a journalist, Scott Patterson, called The Quants. Uh -huh. He calls you the father of the quants. 
and he basically said the quants are the guys who revolutionized and nearly destroyed Wall Street. And that's the hedge funds, all of this stuff that we heard about during the financial crisis and all that. So how do you feel about that? Uh, you're the father of the quants. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? There's a, a great book coming out by a fellow named Paul Wilmot. It uh, should be out in uh, six months or so by uh, John Wiley and Company. It's called uh, The Money Formula. And Paul Wilmot is a very distinguished quant, one of the, one of the best. And he, he said it quite well. He said that what happened was once the quantitative revolution got started on Wall Street, which is where I came in, after it picked up speed, then a lot of people with uh, mathematical training but not a whole lot of uh, street smart sense came in and began using models and form they began using models and formulas that didn't have uh, good thinking behind them. I'll give you one example. Uh, there's something called a um, collateralized mortgage obligation. That's a pool of mortgages that were uh, bundled together and then shares in that pool were sold sure. to the public. And it was behind. In the movie, The Big Short, anybody yes. that saw that, that's that stew the guy was making, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that was one of the big things that uh, brought down the economy in 2008, 2009. So the quants uh, made assumptions when they evaluated those things. They said, well, the chance of uh, prepayment on these things is such and such. The chance of defaults is such and such. Well, those chances aren't quantifiable. And when I looked at that problem back in 1985, I said, you can't build a proper valuation theory on these things because those two things are not possible to quantify. You don't know whether there'll be a turn in the economy that causes huge numbers of defaults suddenly. You don't know if the interest rates will shift greatly in one direction or another and move the rate of prepayment way up or way down. So they're building a model on garbage. And so this is, this is where the problem with the quants came in. They used too much math with too little basis for what they were doing. And that, the reason that has gone on and will continue to go on is because the sell side of Wall Street wants products and they want to get people to buy the products and they want to get paid for doing all this. So they keep pumping stuff out and a lot of the quants just ratify these terrible products but they don't have a sound basis for it. So I guess you're answering the question I wanted to follow up with, is, which is all these financial reforms that were enacted after <clears throat> the financial uh, crisis, uh, are they working? Uh, are we going to avoid another uh, financial meltdown? Well, the financial industry, on the one hand, and the um, more libertarian among the political class don't like these regulations. They want to get rid of them. Those regulations or regulations of that type were originally enacted back in the 30s, uh, the first and second Glass-Steagall Acts, for example. And then uh, more regulations were enacted in the 90s. And uh, then there was a great effort on the part of the financial industry to get rid of them. And one of the reasons they want to get rid of them is they like leverage because they can make a lot more money when things are good. And they're not too scared of what's going to happen if things blow up like they did in 1929, like they did in 2008, 2009, like they did with long-term capital management in 1998 and so forth. They're not too worried about that because we, the taxpayers, will bail them out. So it's heads they win, tails the rest of us lose. And so that's the problem. Uh, about regulation. That's why there's so much opposition to it. All right, so uh, the bottom line is, uh, uh, are, are the reforms, have we, have we reformed enough? No, and the, uh, my, I predict that uh, the next administration will roll back as many of these uh, safety net provisions as they possibly can, because they think less regulation is better than more. Now, okay. I'm not saying they're wrong, but I am saying that in the past, it's not been good. Okay. Uh, what, we've got about a minute. So uh, if you can, in a minute, there's been much talk about high frequency trading. Michael Lewis wrote a book about it. And there are some people who say that's these computers that people erect so they can like get into the, you know, a millisecond and make a deal. Uh, and some, and 
a lot of money to be made, I guess, but a lot of people say this makes the market more efficient. Others say it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, like a cancer on this system. How do you feel? High frequency trading transfers about $30 billion a year from the pockets of all the regular investors who are actually buying and selling stuff for a reason to the pockets of the manipulators who run the computers. Now, the claim that it makes the more market more efficient or more liquid is, in my opinion, smoke. Okay, and that was perfect timing, uh, Ed. <laughs> and uh, so, so much for this. Now, we do have a part two coming up, and uh, we'll continue the discussion. There's a lot of other things I want to get into. Warren Buffett, Bernie Madoff, Rudy Giuliani, and a lot of other things. That will be on our next show. But for now, you can watch this show again and post shows by going to pbsocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter on YouTube. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again with the next show on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University, with its Center for Science and Technology, under construction in Orange, California, is a proud sponsor of Inside OC.